the history that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're gonna investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're gonna get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. In its earliest days, America was a vast land of opportunity. We grew up learning about people like Lewis and Clark who mapped the West, but not much about the people who came before them, the fur traders. Fur was big business in the 1600s. Traders from many European nations were fighting to gain dominance at a time when the map of America looked very different. In the mid-1600s, the Northeast was controlled by the English, the Southeast by the Spanish, and land just east and west of the Mississippi was owned by the French. In 1803, Thomas Jefferson bought a large chunk of that territory from the French in what history calls the Louisiana Purchase. The question I have now is, how did the French get the land they ultimately sold to us? Could they have stolen America from other explorers who arrived here first? I don't know the answer yet, but I do believe that French fur traders were here for more than just animal pelts. I think they had another mission, a secret one to destroy already established land claims and replace them with their own. A key piece of evidence could be sitting in my home state of Minnesota. It's a recently discovered artifact called the Duluth Stone that I've been asked to look at. But first, I've got to find it. There it is. Scott? Hi, Tom. So this is the Duluth Stone, huh? Yes, it is. And this is one of the most incredible artifacts I've ever seen. I mean, if you look here, we got the date inscribed 1679. It's very clear. It looks old. We've got the name Duluth. No question what that is. And in my mind, this can only be the early French explorer, Daniel Duluth. Well, Duluth, this one I actually know quite a bit about. He was actually commissioned to come out here um, not only to explore the region, but also to stabilize it for commercial interests. Um, he arrived at the modern site of Duluth in 1679. If this is actually dated correctly to 1679, it would certainly be a significant find. Daniel Graysalon, Sir Duluth, was a French nobleman born in 1639. When he was in his late 30s, he was sent to what is now Minnesota to pave the way for French expansion. The journeys of Duluth and other early French explorers were remarkable. They entered into a wild frontier where Lewis and Clark wouldn't step foot for another 125 years. French explorers hoped to find gold and silver, but they discovered something just as valuable, animal pelts. Furs were high fashion in Europe, and America had an abundance of beaver, fox, mink, and otter. Native Americans initially traded animal pelts with the French, but eventually they taught the explorers how to catch the animals themselves. Daniel Duluth was on a mission to make peace with the Native Americans in an effort to ensure the long-term success of the fur trade. Does that make him the first uh, European explorer in what is now Minnesota? 
No, actually, there was French and European exploration here as early as 1615. The fur trade was extremely competitive. Few people realize that the fur trade actually played a significant role in determining the destiny of America. So in this area, what is now Minnesota, would Duluth have been here in 1679? Yeah, the historical record does place him in this region. This Duluth stone may be incredibly important. It could be the earliest evidence of a French land claim in the Midwest. But if it is a land claim, I'm certain it's not the first one left here in Minnesota. Well, you know, everything that I see so far is really starting to tie together very nicely. We've got what looks like period writing that appears to be consistent with the time period, the block style writing of his name and the separation of his name. And, you know, the weathering does look advanced. So I'd like to do a little more work there. But there is one other thing that is vitally important, and that is the location of where this stone is. Let me show you something. You know, Tom, I've done a little research about these early French explorers, mm -hmm. like Duluth, and not only were they trying to expand the fur trade, but they were also here in North America claiming land. Yeah, that's absolutely true. In fact, there was actually a French land claim at Sault Ste. Marie shortly before Daniel Duluth arrived in this region. So you think the Duluth stone is a land claim? I'm convinced it is. In the late 17th century, there was a land claim practice that the French and the Dutch had for sure where if they placed a land claim stone in the ground or carved one on a rock like this, they could lay claim to the entire river system or systems and all the land associated with it. So in my mind, based on that, this Duluth stone is vitally important. This is the Continental Divide, and the rivers flow north to Lake Superior and south into the St. Croix, Mississippi watershed. Continental divides are found across America. They occur where rivers and streams part and start flowing in two different directions. These divides were very important to early explorers. They would lay down rocks at these spots, allowing them to claim ownership of the waters in both directions. Whether or not this is a land claim or whether it's simply Duluth writing his name on a rock for posterity, pending the results of testing and dating, um, I think it's, it's a remarkable find. There's more work that I want to do, but I have to admit, it looks good to me, but you're right, it does have to be vetted out and we'll do that. Are there any other similar land claim stones? Actually, there is uh, another land claim stone here in Minnesota. You've heard of the Kensington Runestone. Yeah, I've actually had a chance to see this stone. It's an incredible artifact. Well, it is. I mean, it was found in 1898 by a farmer who was clearing trees. It's dated 1362, and it has a long inscription that includes a phrase, taking up land. The Kensington runestone's primary function was as a land claim made by the Templars, and it was found on the North-South Continental Divide of North America. So we have two land claim stones here in Minnesota. One is a French land claim, the other the Kensington runestone, but there's another land claim stone that's not on display. Have you ever heard of Pierre Lavrandre? Pierre Lavrandre was the first explorer of French descent born in what's now Quebec. He and his sons were French explorers and fur traders who made their mark half a century after Daniel Duluth. I suspect the Lavrandres were looking for previously placed land claims like the Kensington Runestone. But I believe there were other land claims, specifically one that I've learned about that's covered with strange symbols. If I can find it, it may prove there were explorers here from Europe way before the French. Well, there's one thing that many people don't know about Lavrandre. He actually found an inscribed stone that I think might be another land claim. So Scott, where is this other stone? It went missing about 100 years ago. But I do have a few leads, and I'm gonna do my damnedest to find it. Three hundred years ago, North America was a vast land with territory that was up for grabs. Different European nations were vying for land in what amounted to an epic game of capture the flag. The question is, were the French playing dirty? I wonder if explorer Daniel Duluth could have removed someone else's land claim before he placed his own. A rock with his name 
and the year 1679 carved on it. I'm running tests on the Duluth stone in my lab in an effort to find out if it's as old as it seems. That's not the only thing I'm working on. A generation after Daniel Duluth, another French fur trader, Pierre Lavrandre, may have uncovered a different artifact. Unlike the Duluth land claim, the so-called Lavrandre stone is missing. The Lavrandre stone could be evidence of a pre-Columbian land claim to America. If the French found it and took it, it could prove they were trying to steal America from someone who got here before them. I need to find that stone to find the truth, and I think there's a historian who can help me. You know, I'd like to learn a little bit more about this Lavrandre character. What I'm trying to understand more about is, did the early explorers that came to the North American continent, were they actually trying to steal America? Were they really secret agents that were trying to expand the borders of their countries? Well, secret agents, I don't know, but certainly they were engaged in commercial warfare. You know, all across America, the legacy of these early explorers is preserved. It's all over Minneapolis with uh, Hennepin County, LaSalle Avenue, all named for the early explorers. But one name you don't hear is Pierre Lavarandri. So Tracy, tell me a little bit about Pierre Lavarandri. I think to understand Lavarandri, you have to know him in context. You know, the, the other European nations that were competing for North America at the time, the English, the French, of course, the Dutch, and the Spanish. But around here, it's all about the French. <laughs> well, that's true. I mean, many of these explorers' legacies are preserved in the street system here. LaSalle's just two blocks down the street. That's right. And LaSalle, he's the one that named the whole area Louisiana in honor of King Louis. OK, so land, obviously, was the big prize that they were looking for over here, and fur trading, of course. What else were they looking for? They needed Indian allies. And so they were looking for alliances. Sure. Well, you aren't going to get anything done here without cooperation of the natives. This is uh, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So tell me a little bit about Pierre Lavrandre's early life. Well, he was born in 1685 in Three Rivers, Quebec. He became a soldier at age 12. He's a cadet uh, fighting with his Indian allies against the English, okay. and uh, he became a farmer. There he, uh, he met, married a young French girl, he uh, raised a family, and uh, at age 43, he got a midlife crisis. Mm. And that's when he became a fur trader. You know, it was part of the job of being a fur trader is to interact with Indian peoples. Okay. And uh, one of the things that's really fascinating about the story, of course, is this bearded white people. We're bearded talking five. about the Mandan, right? Yes. Okay. Those bearded white people Lavrandre heard about weren't white people at all. They were Native Americans, specifically members of the Mandan tribe. The reference to them as bearded white people is because of a similarity and rumored biological connection between them and the Welsh. It's not just a facial resemblance either. The Mandan boats look like those used by the Welsh. Some people think the similarity stem from a pre-Columbian voyage by the Welsh to the Midwest, where the two groups intermixed. But it's a connection that most historians and Tracy don't support. Lavarandri was the first contact that white people ever made with the Mandan Indians, the Hidatsa Indians, the Cheyenne Indians. And uh, he and his sons were opening up the Northern Great Plains. So really, Pierre Lavrandre was uh, 75 years or so before Lewis and Clark, who really did the same mission, right? Yes, 66 years before Lewis and Clark. When I investigated the mysterious death of Meriwether Lewis, I learned that President Jefferson asked the explorers to look for evidence of the earlier contact by ancient Welshmen as they traveled west. Is it possible French explorers like Daniel Duluth and the Lavrandres removed earlier stone land claims before laying down their own? And if that's the case, they may have stolen America from the Welsh. So you said that Pierre Lavrandre was working with the French government to try to expand the fur trade business. Do you think that he could also have been performing a secret mission, a secret land claim mission? You know, the possibility exists. 
Have you ever heard of the LeBrandre Stone? No. Well, let me show you something. This is an excerpt from a Swedish botanist uh, memoirs who met Pierre Lavrandre towards the end of his life in 1749 in Montreal. And as the story goes, Lavrandre had a few too many. Hey, <laughs> who's doing a lot of that in those days? <laughs> and uh, a slip of the tongue that was recorded by this botanist who wrote down a story that Lavrandre told him. Listen to this. They found on a large plain great pillars of stone leaning against each other. You know, there is one place where geologically it matches these pillars that are described. It's in Alberta, Canada. At last, they met a large stone, like a pillar, which was covered on both sides with unknown characters called Tartarian script, from whence it was sent to the Count de Maripas in France. The Count of Maripas was a powerful French leader skilled in military strategy and a mastermind of French intelligence. The question is, why would Lavrandre be sending a stone with strange inscriptions back to a powerful politician in France? I think the Lavrandre family and other French fur traders and explorers were, in essence, the Count's secret agents. I think they may have had orders to send back anything that would threaten France's interests in the New World like land claims placed by earlier explorers. Tartarian is an old Eastern European script, which resembles Scandinavian runes, very similar to those on the Kensington runestone and possibly other early languages as well. If Lavrandre saw Tartarian script on a stone, he'd naturally reach the conclusion the French weren't the first ones here. Someone else made it to the New World before them. So the Count de Maripas was definitely communicating with Mr. Lavrandre about the fur trade, and apparently he had another mission. Well, that's, that's just remarkable. I, you know, not a biographer has written about this. Nor would I expect there to be anything yeah. if this was a secret mission. Well, Lavrandre himself never made it farther than the Missouri, okay. but he sent his sons on further missions. They went down the Missouri, they went into Wyoming, and then eventually they went farther north into Canada. They set out west and explored the rivers of Alberta and Saskatchewan. So it does put, not Lavrandre, but his sons out there. They found this stone and they brought it back to their father, who then sent it to France. That stone could be very important because I'm thinking maybe it's actually a medieval land claim mm -hmm. stone. Maybe Lavrandre was one of many explorers who was clearing out the old and putting in the new. I'm investigating the idea that French fur traders acted as secret agents for the French government. I believe Daniel Duluth, the guy who the Minnesota city is named after, left this stone as a land claim for France. Who knows, he might have made off with someone else's earlier land claim too. I'm trying to track down a stone that was reportedly found by another French explorer, Pierre Lavrandre and his family. Some think it could be proof pre-Columbian explorers were here long before the French. An ancient journal suggests Lavrandre sent that stone to his boss, Count of Maripas in Paris, possibly eliminating it as a land claim so the French could place their own. Turns out, I'm not the first to search for this stone. In 1911, someone connected with the Minnesota Historical Society searched museums in Paris for the Lavrandre stone. But there's one place he may not have looked, the Church of St. Sulpice, a breathtaking place of worship that Lavrandre's boss, the Count of Maripas, had a hand in designing. I think the church might hold clues or even the stone itself, so I need to travel to France. There are no photos of the Lavrandre stone, but I do know something about the writing on it. Supposedly, the language on the stone is written in Tartarian, an old Eastern European script, but I think it could just as easily have been runes or another medieval language. 
it's easy to see how someone could confuse runes with Tartaria. It's possible that the Lavrandri stone ended up here because of Count de Maripas' connection to this French church. Michel, thank you for taking the time to meet with me today. Thank you very much. I welcome you to Saint-Sulpice. Tell me a little bit about this amazing church. Well, it was started in 1645 by the founder of the company of Saint-Sulpice priests who specialize in running seminaries everywhere in the world. The church was completed 99 years later. Does the church house historical artifacts here? Many, many. It does. Of course, and of great quality the stained glass window showing Christ and the historic shell that was brought to France at the time of Columbus from the South Pacific and it was used later here as a holy water font. The reason I'm asking about artifacts is because a French explorer by the name of Pierre Le Verandre was placing his own land claim plaques for France and he uh, reportedly found a stone that uh, had an inscription on it that uh, some believe was carved in runes and sent here to St. Sulpice. So that's what I'm looking for here uh, in your church. I've never heard of such a stone, but uh, perhaps you can tell me a little more about it. What I believe is that Lavrandre was looking for older land claims to clear them out so he could put his own French land claims down um, to claim the land in North America. Do these look familiar at all to you? Not at all. <laughs> I don't. I'm sorry. This is an example of Tatarian script used by the Tartars going back to ancient times. I've never seen anything like that. All right. Well, this is uh, reportedly what was on the Lavrandre stone. But why was this stone sent to a church, Saint Sulpice or any other? It makes a lot of sense to me that Lavrandre would have sent the stone to Count de Maripa, uh, who must have been his superior in some way because he was reporting back something that he had found that he believed might have been a previous land claim. And if the French were trying to stake out land in North America, obviously you wouldn't want older land claims to usurp your land claims. Do you have any of uh, de Maripas papers here? Well, I'm afraid we don't. Uh, at the time of the French Revolution, this church was pillaged. Many documents were removed or stolen or destroyed. The French Revolution lasted a decade. Between 1789 and 1799, people were fed up with all the power the aristocracy and the priests had. The revolution marked the rise of democracy. But churches like St. Sulpice were raided or ruined, and valuable artifacts were lost, destroyed, or stolen. Perhaps even the Lavrandri stone. They just took things away. In Saint-Sulpice, a lot of damage was done. The church was changed to a venue for political meetings. Mm -hmm. All the religious objects were removed. Well, Michelle, even if that stone isn't here, I think there are more clues out there. I think that Le Brandre was not only placing land claims for France at that time, but he was also trying to obliterate previous land claims laid by anybody who came before him. I'm in Paris, searching for a legendary stone that French explorers may have stolen from America in the mid-1700s. I think the Lavrandri stone could prove ancient cultures came to North America long before the French did. My investigation led me to a French church, but I didn't find the stone I'm looking for. What I did discover was that many artifacts were lost, damaged, or destroyed during the French Revolution. Next, I'm going to what I believe is the scene of the crime, the place from where the Lavrandres may have first encountered the stone with the strange writing on it.
Based on descriptions in an old diary, I think the Lavrandres may have stolen the rock from this place, Riding on Stone Park in Canada. There are great stone pillars everywhere, just like those mentioned in the diary. If I'm lucky, there might be similar carvings still here. The Lavrandre stone itself was identified as containing Tartaria, an ancient East European script with characters that look a lot like runes. Could the Lavrandre stone be proof that ancient Europeans, perhaps the Welsh, made it to America and left a carved rock as a land claim? I think French explorers came looking for land claims, and once they found them, removed the stones and left their own. That may have happened with the recently discovered Duluth stone, which I'm having evaluated back at my lab for authenticity. I saw many Native American carvings while I was walking around the park. Unfortunately, none of them resembled runes or Tartarian script, the markings supposedly found on the Lavrandri stone. But I'm hoping someone from the local Blackfoot tribe can help me find clues I might be missing. Hi, Scott. Well, Janita, I have to say this is stunningly beautiful, and I have to believe it's probably a sacred place, is it not? It is a sacred place for the Blackfoot people. So out of all of our territory, this is the most sacred place. Well, the geology is amazing as well. The softer rock, which creates these cliffs and these tall columns, I think you call them hoodoos? Yeah, that's what we call them. The Blackfoot would actually call them spirit rocks. So when I was hiking around here, I noticed that there's a lot of petroglyphs. I, I did see a lot of what has to be Blackfoot art here. Tell me a little bit about that. So we've got the largest concentration of rock art in the plains of North America. Really? And we have some of the most unique rock art in the world. You know, we're talking about carving in rock, and that's part of the reason I'm here. Um, there's a story uh, that involves a man by the name of Pierre Lavrandre. Pierre Lavrandre was an early French explorer he reportedly sent his two sons into this area trying to find a passage to the Pacific. Um, apparently they were led by the Blackfoot and it was here that they reportedly found an inscribed stone with what was called Tartarian script. And I have a couple of examples of some of the script. If you look at these characters and then if you look at these carved characters which are Scandinavian runes, you can see that the similarity is striking. Mm -hmm. Have you seen anything like this around here at all? Well, just seeing the lines on there, we've got many places that have lines that are, are drawn in there, but due to erosion, it's hard to pick out the details in some places. So it's possible there could be some writing around here that uh, could look like this. It's possible. Hearing that there could have been carving similar to the Lavrandri stone in this park may be important. It makes me even more convinced that pre-Columbian European explorers made it here and left their mark. So what do you think the stone was doing here? I think it was a very old land claim and it was put at this particular place for a reason. What I think Lavrandre's sons were doing, I think they found out about this or knew about this older land claim and they came here to clear it out and then bury lead plaques for a more modern land claim, uh, claiming land here for France. For us, you know, we don't believe anyone really owns the land. We don't actually have a term for ownership. That's a modern concept? Yes, it is. Okay. Well, it's an old concept uh, to, uh, to the white people, and that was the main mission mm -hmm. that Lavrandre was here for. So you mentioned a lead plaque. Where is that? Well, Lavrandre buried a lead plaque in South Dakota, and I've never seen it, but there might be some clues there because that's what I think this is all about. It was about claiming land, and in essence, trying to steal America. I'm exploring the question of whether French fur traders and explorers were on a covert quest to steal America. I think French explorers like Pierre Lavrandre and Daniel Duluth may have removed land claims placed by others and replaced them with their own. 
This could explain the Duluth stone that I saw in Minnesota. If it's authentic, that means Duluth carved it over 330 years ago, likely to claim land for the French. I'm awaiting results that could give me the answers I'm looking for. In Lavrandre's case, I've got reason to believe his sons found a stone carved in a mysterious language. I think they found it at Writing on Stone Park and gave it to their father, who sent it to a government official in France. I'm about to see a land claim I know for sure that the Lavrandres did place. It's here in South Dakota. A monument overlooking the Missouri River now marks the spot where the plaque was found. But the lead plaque itself is preserved nearby at the South Dakota State Historical Society. I'm very anxious to take a look at this Lavrandre plaque, but I have a question for you. Um, Pierre, South Dakota, is that named after Pierre Lavrandre? Well, let me correct you right away. It's not pronounced Pierre, South Dakota, it's Pierre, South Dakota. Okay. And actually the town was named after Pierre Chateau, who was a fur trader who had a, started a fort up the river ways. You know, I've learned an awful lot about fur traders, including uh, Lavrandre and his four sons that were uh, in this area. Um, I just came from Canada, as a matter of fact, where many people believe an ancient land claim stone was found by Lavrandre's sons. But I'm here to look at the Lavrandre plaque. Should we take a look at it? Yeah, let's go, come on. Okay. So Jay, this is the Lavrandre lead plaque. It's over 270 years old now, right? Absolutely. It was placed in 1743. Okay. Um, it wasn't found until the 1913. There were four kids that are credited with being the discoverers, and they were up uh, and with other kids up on this bluff overlooking what's now the city of Fort Pier. And I guess it was a kind of a common hangout for, for kids to be at. And one of the kids saw this thing protruding out of the ground, went over and kicked at it and picked it up. and started brushing it off and noticed there was handwriting on it. And so they were, they were fascinated by it. One of the other kids took it, brushed it off more, and saw the date, 1743. So who placed it? Was it his sons, I would guess? Two of his sons, um, Francois and um, Louis Joseph. And they're the ones who actually placed it. And we know that because on the reverse side of it is carved um, into the metal um, their names and the date that they placed it, March 30th, 1743. Does this represent, for South Dakota, the oldest evidence of European contact in the state? Yeah, it's the first physical evidence of, of non-Indians being in South Dakota. And what does it say on this side? Oh, it's, it's stamped um, on the one side um, into the lead. It's got the fleur de lis, it's written in Latin, and it basically claims the region for King Louis XV of France. I know enough about land claim practices to know that they get placed at spots that grant the most amount of land. One reason I think that the loose stone is a land claim is because it was found on a continental divide. This meant all the land to the north and south would belong to the country of whoever placed the claim. For Daniel Duluth, that country was France. If the Lavrandre plaque is also a French land claim, then where it was placed is also important. The placement of this plaque, what's significant about its location? It's where the Bad River flows into um, the Missouri River. And it provides a great vantage point for France in the standpoint that it's the Missouri River drainage system which feeds into the Mississippi drainage mm -hmm. system and claiming this large um, geographic area for the, for the King of France. This particular plaque was one of maybe other plaques that served as the foundation for what would eventually become the Louisiana Purchase, right? Absolutely. The Louisiana Purchase um, is, is, is key in the, in the history of the United States. Clearly, you know, um, France owned the land for a long time. You can't underestimate the importance of the Louisiana Purchase. When Thomas Jefferson signed that deal with the French, he more than doubled the size of the United States. Who knows what America would look like today if that deal hadn't gone down? Well, Jay, I don't think anybody's going to debate that this is a land claim plaque 
placed by the Lavrandre party claiming land for France that eventually became the Louisiana Purchase. But there's also some evidence that suggests that the Lavrandre party may have traveled farther west and found an earlier land claim. Lavrandre told this story that his sons found an inscribed stone at the top of a pillar and they gave it to their father. So what happened to the stone? Lavrandre said he put it on a ship to France uh, to the Count de Maripa, and it's never been seen since. I think that this is an older land claim. I think it's very important. In the end, the Count of Maripa may be the only one who really knows the truth about whether or not explorers like the Lavrandres were in America stealing other people's land claims and replacing them with their own. Everything I've seen leads me to believe that Daniel Duluth the French fur trader who came 60 years before the Lavrandres may actually have had the same mission. I suspect he may have been sent to hunt down medieval land claims in Minnesota, like the Kensington runestone, which wasn't found until the late 1800s. He may very well have found one and removed it, then replaced it with the Duluth stone. I just want to get back to my lab where tests are being run that will hopefully solve this ancient mystery. My investigation into whether early French explorers stole land claims and replaced them with their own has taken place in three countries. Here in the United States, in France, and in Canada. I searched in vain for a possibly medieval land claim that I believe the French stole. It's called the Lavrandre Stone. It's documented in historical records, and I think it was shipped off to Paris, only to be lost in the French Revolution. But there's one stone that isn't lost, the Duluth Stone, a newly discovered boulder that could be a missing land claim left by another French fur trader, Daniel Graysalon, Sir Duluth. Hey, Scott. How you doing? Good, how's the investigation going? Well, it's going pretty well, although I have to say I've got good news and I've got bad news. The bad news is I was not able to find the Lavrandre Stone in France. It looks like the French Revolution has something to do with it. Um, all the archives and uh, artifacts were taken from St. Sulpice Church during the Revolution, and who knows where they are. But I do have some good news. Take a look at this. What do you have for me? Well, I did a little work on the Duluth Stone, and this relative age weathering study worked out pretty good. There are some tombstones in the same area, and I was able to get some close-up photographs here of the carved surfaces. Now, this is a tombstone that's just under 100 years old, and see how sharp the edges are on the grooves here at the top? Now, take a look at the Duluth Stone. This is the uh, groove right here, and notice how rounded the top edges are and the bottom of the groove is also very rounded. That's consistent with lengthy weathering, and it's much different than the tombstone, which is only 100 years old. So when I look at the weathering here, it looks consistent with about 350 or so years. So. In my mind, this thing's genuine. Well, it matches the time that Daniel Duluth was in the area. We know he was in that area around 1679, so it definitely fits. Authenticating the Duluth Stone is a huge accomplishment. It's possibly the earliest proof of a French land claim to America. It helps us know who was where and when. It also makes me question Daniel Duluth's motives. He could have been hunting for medieval land claims like the Kensington Runestone, to try and clear out evidence of who was here before. Whether he found any is something we may never know. This thing being genuine, I mean, doesn't it represent the oldest tangible artifact of Europeans in Minnesota? I mean, very likely. I mean, there wasn't really any habitations or permanent European settlements at this time, so I think this is very significant. You think it is significant? I do, too. In fact, I think it's really important, not just for Minnesota history, but American history. Let me show you something. Come here. Sure, what do you have? Looks like ants. This is an ant farm, and ants are really amazing creatures when you stop and think about it. I mean, the amount of ground that they cover, and they're amazingly powerful. In fact, they can carry objects five to 10 times their own weight. Okay, so what does this have to do with the European explorers? 
Well, in my mind, this serves as an interesting analogy. I mean, these guys are working hard, and really, they're answering to the queen, right? Just like these French explorers were working over here in North America and answering to the French crown. Lavrandre and Duluth were burying land claim stones and clearing out the old ones to try to steal America. After everything I've seen in all the places I've been, I'm more convinced than ever that French fur traders and explorers in America were here looking for a lot more than beaver pelts to send back to France. I think they were looking for land claims that might jeopardize their own. Just like ants in my lab, they were working for someone, not a queen, but a king, King Louis of France, looking for ways his country could get a leg up on the competition to claim land in what's now the U.S. In the end, the calculations of the French may have led to the prosperity of Americans. After all, the vast amount of land they claimed, they sold to us in the Louisiana Purchase, creating what is now the United States. Now, with one stone lost and another found, we at least have a better handle on what I think could be our true history. If you have a mysterious artifact or site I need to see, I want to know about it. Go to history.com slash unearthed.